playing games in the wrong way. Imagine for a moment that you're a video game developer. You and your right. team spend years coming up with and crafting a particular experience. You do everything you can to set a consistent tone and create systems to help guide players so that they feel a certain way when playing. Maybe your game is straightforward or maybe it has a fair bit of variance with how it can be approached, but regardless of how many moving pieces there are, every aspect of what you design is made to feed into a specific vision of what the game should be. Uh, yeah. So the, this is him getting at the fact that the devs having uh, like a mental thing about how their game should be played. However, whenever you introduce a player into like this organic world, well, it's not really organic, into this world that you created, anything that can go wrong probably will go wrong, <laughs> all right, in terms of you know, the intended path for you to go through, the intended difficulty, you know, there's always going to be like some sort of bugs or exploits that the player is going to encounter. Um, but, but, but yeah, this is, this is what he's getting at. You meticulously rework sections over and over in the hope of getting things just right. And then players finally get their hands on it and... They ruin it. games the wrong way. One of the few guarantees of game design is that players will approach any given title in ways that the developers never could have anticipated. Mm -hmm. It's unavoidable and takes many different forms. The most common examples of this are the unintentional ways people play games wrong. For instance, players misunderstanding mechanics or directions, causing them to engage with things in weird or suboptimal ways. Like I've heard of multiple people who have played through the entirety of Dark Souls without realizing they could lock onto enemies. Also, when oh I put God. out a video that mentioned Mario is able to sprint in the original Super Mario Bros, I received hundreds of comments of people saying that they didn't know he could do that. Could These sorts sprint? of misunderstandings happen all the time, and while most people will figure things out eventually, they do have a major impact on how players experience games. This form of unintentionally playing titles in the wrong way has always been fascinating to me. Really, it's kind of the basis for the Gaming for a Non-Gamer series. Yeah. But to be honest, what interests me even more are the intentional ways people play games quote-unquote wrong. The ways that don't- Okay, so he just said there's- there's a difference between intentionally playing a game the wrong way and purposely playing a game the wrong way. Um, when, when you play a game like in a, like wrong accidentally, uh, I think it's fine for the most part because, you know, you could break it down into like categories of like single player games, multiplayer games, you know, uh, you know, games where you have to interact with like a, a stranger or whatever. Um, Whenever you're like, quote unquote, this could be breaking down like so many ways. Like you could take World of Warcraft, for instance, like a 16, 17 year old game. Like how many different ways did. Like, like when you play World of Warcraft back in the day, there was no like, uh, like there weren't any forums. There weren't any guides, you know, in like vanilla. Wow. Uh, what was it? Classic TBC, classic Wrath. I remember playing the game back in the day and I was like complete dog shit at the game. But you know, I still had kind of fun like jumping into Ventrilo, playing with my boy Ted or whatever, who was like the, the guild lead slash raid lead as we like progressed through like each raid when I was like, what, 12, 15 or somewhere in there, 14, 15. And you know, you could argue that like, I was a bad player and because I was a bad player, I was playing a game, a game in, in optimal way or whatever. Um, and then if you look at like current wow, um, the game is hard as hell. There's a huge skill curve and you, you, I mean, I don't know. I haven't really played it recently, but as far as I know, unless you're playing like whatever flavor of the month class, it's like, you're not really playing the game the correct way or whatever. <laughs> and people don't want to play with you when, when you don't, when you play a game that tries to force you 
to interact with other people, if you're not playing the game in the correct way that they expect, then they're, then you're just not going to get played with. <laughs> okay, that sounds like weird or whatever, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, that's why there there's things called, like that's why ladders exist, why like ranks exist in like FPSs. There's like a ladder, you know, uh, bronze, silver, gold, so on, so forth. And it's like the higher you get up, um, the more quote unquote correctly you start to play the game. Uh, this doesn't really happen in like RPGs slash adventure type games because in those types of games, it's, it's more understood that, you know, it's more free form. You know, you can play the game mostly however you want. You can use mostly whatever weapon you want, especially for like the Dark Souls games or whatever. It, it's very free form. Don't come from a lack of understanding of a title's mechanics, but instead from a keen awareness of them that players utilize to create their own experiences with. One of the most obvious examples of this can be seen with speedrunning, where players pull apart every aspect oh, yeah. of the game to find the fastest way to beat it. Through Yeah, when a dev makes a game, or at least like a single player type game, they don't really expect their game to be speed ran through. So all these things that like the like the player community will come up with to try to get through the level as quickly as possible is completely unintentional and is quote unquote the wrong way to play but the players are going to play the game however they want because they pay for the product and once the product is in their hands it's their product <laughs> you know you can't like like most games are like digital now but you can't really like resell it or whatever so once it's once it's in my hands i could do with it what i want <laughs> unintended combinations of mechanics, they essentially break the game. And even though there are many developers who do design their titles with speedrunning in mind, yeah. runners have an uncanny ability of finding paths that developers never could have planned for. Mm -hmm. The argument could also be made that this can be seen- Look at these freaking gigantic chunky CRT TVs, dude. Like, look at this. This is, this is Smash, of course. Oh, the Ludwig Smash, woo! Look at these things a certain competitive scene, Super Smash Bros. Melee being one of the most notable. While things like wave dashing and L canceling were known mechanics. Oh yeah, Nintendo hates the Smash community, dude. They hate the competitive Smash scene. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this game is a party entertainment game. This was not meant to be played competitively. And they completely disavow the whole entire competitive Smash scene at every level. That's hilarious to the dev team Sakurai and I would argue the smash scene has like like one of the best chances uh, of games like getting into the, like the you know the quote unquote Olympics or whatever and being recognized as like a like a, a badass game you know like Super Smash CSGO slash Valorant and probably Rocket League would probably be the best chances uh, or like something like Kovacs or Aimlab or something like that, those games would probably have the best chances of getting into the Olympics because of like how easy they are to watch, read, and like like you understand what's going on. All right, but that's just like a, a, a side tangent or whatever. Ryan Company never could have predicted the way these elements would be combined, mastered, and exploited by the players, leading competitive melee to be a scene driven by community discovery and rule setting rather than developer intention. Beyond those more structured examples, there are also just a ton of people who create objectives and restrictions for themselves when playing a game in order to give it a new challenge. It may be an in-depth and planned out approach to a playthrough, like beating a Mario game without collecting any coins. It may be one Dang. powered by external factors, like killing all the bosses in Bro, look, She's playing the game with like a drawing pad or whatever. That is crazy. The ring while using a drawing tablet, or it might be small, simple tasks thought of in the moment, like getting on a motorcycle and trying to land it on top of a building in GTA 5. What matters is that the player is setting an alternate win state that pushes against the intended experience. Regardless of the form it takes, seeing games be played through unconventional means appeals to a fair amount of people. It forges communities and generates millions upon millions of views on YouTube and Twitch. Oh, yeah. And as an avid fan of playing games and watching them be played in the wrong way, I've recently found myself wondering why what about experiencing games in these ways well because when someone plays a game in like it like an unorthodox way it's interesting and entertaining because 
like if I play a game, I play the game for the most part within the, the rails of like the intended gameplay, you know, sometimes I'll deviate and try to do some weird shit or whatever. But like for the most part, I don't play games to like bug them out and exploit them or whatever. I mean, if I'm playing a game and I like a video pops up on my YouTube and it's like, oh, this speed run, new glitch, infinite money glitch, whatever, infinite damage. I'll be like, I'll be like, I'll like watch it or whatever. But like, I'm, I'm not going to like pay it any mind. I'll just watch it and be like, oh, that's cool. You know, it just, it happens. It's interesting. It's unique. Is, is so captivating and what aspects of certain titles make them so fun to play in weird ways. Obviously, I've had countless incredible experiences playing titles largely in the way they were intended to be played, but there's something about the times where me and or my friends have shaped our own experiences within a game that resonate with me in a way that nothing else really does. Mm -hmm. So in order to get a better understanding of the topic, I reached out to the world's foremost expert on playing games in the wrong way. I'm Doug Doug. I'm a YouTuber and streamer and I make a lot of videos about playing games in really, really stupid ways and often having my viewers help me in playing the games in very, very stupid ways. Doug Doug's content primarily centers around him presenting a weird idea or challenge to his audience and then seeing how it plays out. There's always a plan he comes in with that he intentionally leaves unfinished in order to give his chat a way to participate. However, his earliest exposure to playing games in unintended ways was far less structured and really the result of just goofing around with friends. Halo 2, Dang. when that came out, that was a huge deal and everybody loved the single player and especially the PvP multiplayer player but me and my friend spent an entire day there's a mission where you drive a tank down a bridge to save some city in earth and mm -hmm. we just i remember this mission and what i tried to do it, when i was a little kid i tried to get get the tank through the whole level and because you could like kind of like drive over some shit or whatever to to the to places where the tank wasn't supposed to be so i tried to keep the tank for as long as i could shot each other with tanks for like three or four straight hours and made no progress in the mission. And I remember going away from that being like, man, Halo's awesome. But like, that is not how you're supposed to play Halo at all. For a lot of people, myself mm. included, the Halo series was a breeding ground for experimenting with seemingly unintended forms of play. Oh, Personally, yeah. I spent hundreds of hours in Halo 2 just messing around with stuff whether it was searching for glitches on various maps or creating Dang. complex out of game rule sets for multiplayer modes in order to play something a bit more engaging than Slayer. Frankly, there's something about the series that kind of lends itself to be played in these ways. It was the heart of early machinima and in general grew mm -hmm. a massive community that developed their own modes that sometimes ended up becoming official ones. Oh yeah, like, I, what was it, in Halo 2? I think this is? I think it was 2. Um, there was a glitch or something where if two players if one player like stood on top of another player's head, like you wedge yourself, both of you like wedge yourself in a corner, uh, the guy with the sword crouches down and the guy on top jumps, like he jumps on your head and then jumps the guy, like the guy on top has to keep spamming jump and just like keep himself wedged in the corner. And then the guy on the bottom, he, what was it it's called? Sword canceling, like where you lunge. And then I think it was like attack reload. I think it was or whatever. Where like you attack but you reload and then you just keep spamming those things back and forth or maybe it was like melee reload i don't remember but you could cancel it and as long as you kept doing that combo and the dude on top of you kept jumping you guys would both like start here or whatever and like you would you could like climb out of the level <laughs> it was so funny because like i remember seeing a video where it was like uh, what was it like some nickelback song <laughs> where it was like can you take me higher I, it's somewhere on youtube or whatever <laughs> And Bungie recognized the community's interest in these things, which led to them adding Forge Mode in Halo 3, their way of giving power to the player base to experiment with things even further. In a sense, acknowledging the value that can come from players creating their own fun. Well, like I think Forge was probably one of the best things in, like a game developer could do for any, any game title. You know, in Call of Duty, they had the map packs or whatever. Like the old, old Call of Duties. It's like, oh, four new maps. Oh, pay us. Ah. Oh. But for Halo, it's just like, nah, we're not going to charge you. Just make your own maps and you could do whatever. Bro, how awesome is that? How far have we come since Forge? You know, is there a developer with enough balls to give us some sort of like Forge type concept in a game again? I don't think so. <laughs> Those days have been 
long gone, long past. Um, there's no way that like any developer would give this much power to a player. If they did, it would probably be like, okay, you got to pay us like uh, 40 bucks just for Forge, and then 60, 60, 70 bucks for the game. And it, it's going to be like a recurring membership type deal where it's like, or no, it'll be like 15 bucks a month for Forge or whatever. In whatever, it doesn't have to just be Halo. It could be like any FPS. And it's like, okay, you're subscribed. Now you get access to the tools. And then if anybody else wants to play your Forge maps, they also have to subscribe to Forge or whatever. It's like, I can already just see it, man. The campaigns and multiplayer modes of each game are mostly well-crafted experiences worth playing. I think what made the series there it is the sword the canceling were the slew of interesting mechanics and intricate play spaces that gave players room to create their own modes of play. I mean, I think certain games just have more of a sandbox or set of tools that can be applied in a lot of different ways where they've developed it so that all the tools in the game can interact in some sort of interesting or unexpected way. So like Breath of the Wild and GTA 5 and Halo, I think all of those share kind of similar attributes of, oh yeah, here's a whole bunch of pieces in the game. Here's the way you are supposed to play them in quotes. But there are so many interesting combinations that can happen if you just sort of slam them together. When examining the games that lend themselves well to be played in the wrong ways, the most notable commonality between the vast majority of them are that they all have interesting physics engines. Oh, ones yeah. that provide flexibility in various ways. Some the bucket on head era in Skyrim. <laughs> that was funny. Sometimes leading to cool movement options and other times just fun chaotic nonsense. Looking again at Melee, there's a reason it has stuck around while oh every God. other version of Smash has fallen off as soon as a new iteration of the game has come out. Its movement options are unparalleled, creating a wildly high ceiling for what can be accomplished in any given match. A similar thing can be said for many of the most popular speedrunning games. They're all about exploiting movement, level design, and even how a title is programmed to get through. Bro, let me see. Wait a sec. high ceiling for what can be accomplished in any given match. A similar thing can be said for many of the most popular speedrunning games. They're all about exp Bro, look how much he is whipping his arm around uh, on M and K. Like, I think you can play the game on controller or whatever, but like, look at how much his arm is going. Like, his sense has got to be so low. Exploiting movement, level design, and even how a title is pro- Oh, shit, you can't even fucking see. Oh, god dang it. Oh. Program to get through it at a ridiculous pace. While technically people can speedrun any game, the ones with the most active communities are generally the ones that have the most interesting forms of movement. And of course, when just considering those self-imposed objectives made by players to shift how a game is played, the adaptability that certain physics systems offer is what allows for so much variety in what players can do. For instance, a title like The Last of Us really can't be played in that many different ways. Sure, someone could set a challenge for themselves, like trying to beat the game without using a gun, but there aren't all that many options for playing it differently than it was intended to be played. Okay, so I think one of the best examples of this, what he's talking about, is Borderlands 2. Borderlands 2, you can play the game in an infinite, well not infinite, but like so many different ways. There's, there's, you know, you could speed run the game, like any percent, any time, whatever. Um, what was it? You can. What was what was the max difficulty in Borderlands Two? Wasn't it like OP Eight? I think it was. It was like speed run to OP Eight, like max difficulty, uh, like any percent, any time or whatever. And then you could play an Allegiance run, which is you pick any character. And you can only use guns from that, like, brand for the character. And then, so, what was it? There was, like, six or seven different, uh, like, gun manufacturers. So, yeah, like, and there were, like, what, four or five? I think there was, like, five or six characters. So that's, like, like 30-plus different ways, 40-plus different ways to play the game right there, just with, like, Allegiance runs. You could do, like, sniper-only uh uh character runs you could do pistol only shotgun only type runs borderlands is 
one of the best examples of this. At least not many that are all that fun. The Last of Us has an incredible world to walk through and explore, but it's not one that can be interacted with in all that many interesting ways that aren't scripted. It's a grounded, linear game that's great in its own right, but is too rigid for players to be able to turn into something else. And there's nothing wrong with that. The game's quality is not dictated by the amount of goofy ways people can find to play it, but it does right. make it harder to go back to. I've seen yeah. how the story plays out, and while all the yeah, when a game pigeonholes itself to you can only play it this one way, yes, the feels are going to be like really high and it's going to be like really memorable, but the replayability is probably not going to be there. Yeah, there's probably a couple exceptions, but for the most part, there's not going to be a lot of replayability, which, you know, he's using Last of Us as an example. This time later, I do still enjoy talking about it. I don't have all that compelling of a reason to actually replay it again, aside right. from seeing how the graphics look in the remake. Now, compare this to titles that aren't so rigid in their construction. The fact that a substantial amount of people are still playing Skyrim in Minecraft 11 years after they were... It's literally the mod community as holding this thing up. It's, it's the, the mod community. <laughs> <laughs> released is indicative of how valuable a title having a certain amount of flexibility can be. There are so many ways that those worlds can be interacted with, which gives players the agency to mess around in countless fun ways. With that said, there is a valid argument that games can have too much flexibility. Just having completely open-ended creativity and you could do whatever you want, I don't think feels particularly satisfying because there's no resistance. And so I think that tension between the game attempting to hold on to the fabric of reality while you poke it in the wrong ways like that's what's super rewarding in a lot of ways and so there actually does yeah. kind of need to be some sort of tension back and forth at least for me to be satisfied by it with titles like minecraft or gary's mod they offer so much freedom that it almost makes it harder to have sufficient stakes and that's not the case for more structured titles pushing against the defined limitations of a game and well it's the same thing like when you poke the bear you know you're essentially just poking the bear and waiting for the bear to like jump back at you you know, there's, you know, you're not really afraid when it's like you're, you're poking like a tiny, cute little puppy. It's like, oh, he's so cute. But when you're poking a bear, it's like, oh my God, that's scary. It's really satisfying. And its world breeds a type of creativity that can be difficult to cultivate when just given free reign over a system. When a game has limitations, you have to learn how to Bro, finesse like things in surfing? just the right way to accomplish your goals. And discovering those things can be really satisfying. Obviously, a lot of this comes down to personal preference. I'm sure plenty of people find a ton of value in the freedom stuff like Minecraft and Gary's Mod provide. But personally, I find it way more compelling to create my own objectives in games that have more limitations because I like the feeling of pushing the boundaries of a system more than I like the feeling of setting them oh yeah get in a banshee try to get out of the level <laughs> Titles with tons of freedom are expressly designed to let players play them however they want, where ones with more limitations aren't. They just have enough interesting mechanics for people to try it anyway. Also, while there are instances when I go into a game with a certain personal objective in mind- Whoa. did he really do this? <laughs> God of War 2018, but every time Kratos says, boy, I take a shot. <gasps> oh, my, uh, it, oh my God. Holy. More often than not, the times when I engage with a title in the wrong way are born out of some organic discovery. Is it possible to place a message over there? Can I get from this side to the other without touching the ground? When given too much freedom, these sorts of challenges generally need more planning and preparation, making it so it isn't really possible for players to just react to situations they may find themselves in. Regardless of preference, providing players with many different ways to experience a game, whether intentionally or not, gives them a reason to revisit it. It is a pretty natural instinct to want to replay games you love. But if you're just going back to play the same experience over and over, it will eventually get stale. So for titles that are unyielding in regards to how they can be approached, eventually they'll just start gathering dust. However, yeah. for games that are more flexible with what players can do, it is much easier to go back to them because their systems can be applied to a variety of different situations. <laughs> and this form of replayability is even further compounded by the use of mods, which can add even more variations to a game and increase its longevity significantly. 
significantly. When titles offer freedom far beyond the intended vision, they give players a strong motivation to come back. It's a way to have a fresh and distinctive experience with a property you already love. Again, a game's longevity or replayability is not the most important thing for every player. To be honest, for me personally, it's an aspect that has never held all that much weight. With that said, I'm extremely envious of those who get to keep finding new and fun playing Skyrim, but you but you max like a single mana or not mana, a single mana or magic like tree or whatever is actually pretty satisfying. On ways to play their favorite games long after they've beaten them. Another key aspect that is often associated with playing games in the wrong way is doing so with other people. Whether it be friends, communities, or just strangers on the internet with similar interests, being able to share weird playthroughs with others can add a lot of value. The most rewarding part of pursuing dumb things is doing it with others. That's mm -hmm. what I really love. That's what draws me to content creation in the first place rather than, you know, just playing games by myself. So that's not an accidental thing that happens on my channel. That's deliberate because that's what makes it super satisfying to me. So I always look for those opportunities if possible, because man, like it's so much cooler to achieve this incredibly stupid thing in GTA five because Twitch chat landed an airplane rather than like me just doing it by myself in a vacuum and then telling people about it after the fact. When I think about my personal experiences with playing games in unintended ways, every single memory that comes to mind is tied to my friends. Sharing those weird, unique moments together that came from a potent mixture of persistence, stupidity, and chance have stuck with me for decades. It's far easier to remember the times when things went off the rails than when we just played games as they were meant to be played. And I don't think that one way is inherently better than the other. Other. They both serve a purpose, but there is something special about the experiences we shared that went against the intended design of a game. One of my now favorite examples of this happened just after I played Journey for the first time. Oh, I dang. adored it and wanted to watch everyone I knew play it so I could live vicariously through them. Seeing my friends react to everything from the breathtaking vistas to the enthralling music to the reveal after the credits of all the players who joined them on their journey brought me a surprising amount of joy. But looking back now, most of their playthroughs blend together. However, there is one that stands out to me still. It was a late night and a group of us were all watching my friend Adam play it. He got through the majority of the game in the way I expected. He certainly engaged with stuff a bit differently than I did and uncovered a few things I hadn't seen before. But all things considered, it was a typical playthrough of the game. That is, up until right before the end. He began his final ascent up the mountain, soaring along scarves and waterfalls, ready to finally reach the destination he had spent the past few hours working towards. And right when he was about to get there, he went off course for a moment and accidentally glitched into the mountain itself. Oh, no matter dang. what he did, he was unable to get out, and every attempt to get back to the path just seemed to get him even more stuck than before. We all laughed for a while, and he jokingly crowned himself as the king of the mountain. After it was clear to me that he wouldn't be able to continue, I told him to reload the game so that he could keep going and see the end. But he refused, simply saying, no, for I am the king of the mountain now. At the time, I did find it funny, but I also really wanted him to see the ending of the game. His choice to stop playing without actually beating it baffled me, because that's just what you're supposed to do, especially when you're that close to the end. But now, I kind of get it. While every player's time with Journey is unique in its own way, he's probably one of the only people to have ever finished it in the way he did. The experience belonged to him, and he chose not to see the glitch as a mistake, but instead as a moment. One that was part of the journey and not something that occurred outside of it. When making the decision, I don't think he actively thought about how ending the game in that fashion would be a one-of-a-kind experience, but I do think it influenced his choice nonetheless. Also, to him, interrupting Journey's natural flow seemed antithetical to everything he had grown to understand about it. So when he got to a point where the only way to get back on the conventional path was through a menu, he chose to let his adventure end on what felt like his own terms. What seemed to play the biggest role in his decision, though, was the fact that all of us were there together, watching this weird, unintended thing happen. It was unique, fun, and really stupid, which is a good descriptor for the best parts of my childhood. He's also told me since that part of why he didn't finish the game was because all of us were pushing him to do it, but he found it much funnier yeah. to dedicate fully to the bits, which in hindsight was definitely the right call. Regardless of the full reason why, his refusal to end the game in the way he was supposed to led to something far more memorable than just coming across a glitch or beating the game as intended. It led to him becoming the king of the mountain.
While this sort of thing could happen to someone when playing the game alone, it is hard for me to imagine it having the same kind of impact, it being a moment that was shared between us, one that felt like something no one else had ever seen, is why I still remember it today. And this seems to be a pretty common feeling. What I love to do is like share my love for games with other people. I actually realized that growing up, what I had loved so much about games was not playing games in my room by myself. It was playing games with my brother. That was the, my favorite experience as a kid, is him playing and me getting to sit there and watch it with him. So the, the sharing it with viewers and an audience, especially during the actual development of the goal and the challenge, that's what I truly love. Having them really be involved in the development of this thing at, at the end, like that is incredibly special, I think. Sharing these sorts of experiences what makes them feel more important, regardless of how silly or inconsequential they are. Having other people be invested in whatever stupid thing you end up doing is a huge part of what gives something life. And being able to talk about it years and years later with the people who were there for it is what cements it into a sort of legend. All in all, games are different from every other medium because they hand control over to the people experiencing them. When a title releases, in a way, the ownership of it is passed on to the players. They are the ones who engage with it, leading to developer intention taking a backseat to player expression. Of course, depending on the type of game, the amount of actual agency the player has will vary. With a lot yeah. of titles, there really is only the illusion of agency. Players may control the pace at which things move forward, but there aren't all that many systems they can engage with. So for the most part, even if they don't realize it, they are being led by the developers through the use of tight and clever design. And again, this can be great. Some of my favorite moments in video games are ones where I played right into the developers' hands and seemingly did things in the exact way they expected me to do them. Oh, However, dang. it is also nice to really feel in control of an experience, to be given a set of tools or be put in a situation that you weren't meant to be put in and decide for yourself what to do. While the worlds and mechanics of games like these are designed in a way to let you do oh yeah, you can things, get up that. They weren't made with the intention that you would. No one aside from yourself or maybe the people around you are dictating the experience. And I think there's something liberating about that. To do things that no one else would think to do, that no one else would probably want to do. It isn't necessarily the best way to play a game, but it certainly is a special one. And in general, it's nice to have an intriguing reason to revisit old favorites, and it's also fun to experiment with other people in order to discover what the limits of a title are. I imagine the vast majority of game developers have come to accept and even appreciate the ways players engage with their games that they never could have predicted. I also suspect that some developers design their titles with the hope that players will discover weird and unexpected ways to play them. It's like, bro, nowadays? Triple A games are making less and less like sequels and they're putting all of their efforts into like one singular live service game. And it's like the things that you can actually like freeform do is like getting smaller and smaller. I mean, yeah, there's a couple of like outliers or whatever that they're probably have like some sort of exception, but like a lot of the mainstream games or whatever that I can think of, it's like, they're all always online live service. Uh, if you try to bug it out or, or exploit it, we're just going to patch it. All right. That's, that's what gaming has like become now. Games don't exist in a vacuum, and at the end of the day, players are the ones who bring life to them. So to a degree, the way we play a game helps define what it is. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think in the same way that someone like Doug Doug loves sharing games with his audience, in the same way that I love sharing games with my friends, developers love sharing games with us, as they get to see what all of their hard work will turn into, even when we end up playing them in the wrong ways. But enough talk about doing stuff wrong. Instead, let me tell you about this video sponsor, Nebula, who does stuff right. For those who don't know, what that Nebula is. is a streaming service where many of the best creators on this website post their work. Jacob Geller, Game Maker's Toolkit, People Make Games, and you know, also me. There are a ton of perks to getting Nebula. Along with having early access to videos from your favorite creators, it also has a ton of exclusive content, ranging from originals, which are shows made by creators through the support of Nebula, to exclusives, which generally consist 
consist of things that are interesting but don't really work all that well on YouTube. For instance, the full interview I had with Doug Doug for this video is posted over there. Through Nebula, I've been able to make stuff I never would have been able to without their support. And I'm currently working on other projects that will be on there in the not so distant future. So keep an eye out for that. There is so much high quality content on Nebula that you will never run out of amazing things to watch. And in terms of supporting creators, a single view there goes way further than one on YouTube. If you sign up using the link below, you can get Nebula for just $4 a month or 40 for the entire year. Oh, it's an incredible way to see some of the best content out there while also helping out creators like me. So give it a shot if you want to see some cool stuff. Hey, subscribe, YouTube. Anyway, YouTube. thanks to Nebula for sponsoring this video. For the rest of you, how you doing? I hope you're well. Big shout out to my patrons for making this channel possible. This? I like this video. This video was awesome. About playing games the wrong way. It's like... It's been like a long time since I actually played like a single player game that's like new to me because I'm just like so jaded over like games over the years and years like after they've been coming out and whatnot. Um, I mean, I, I got like a, a big enough like uh, like backlog or whatever in Steam or whatever. I mean, I probably should go back and play some of the games the wrong way just to uh, try to try to attempt to, to recapture some like childhood memories and whatnot but no i think this is it was a great video um yeah this is really good uh yeah uh i want to see more from raz uh, this is another banger um but yeah that's pretty much it um yeah that's it take it easy guys see ya